what we're going to do this morning is survey the, old, the New Testament. Um, there are six explicit passages that speak and deal with hospitality, and I want to look at those six passages together and, and bring us home to this. Um, let, me, let me pray. Let me pray for us. Father, would you please um, come to us this morning by your Spirit who rides the chariot of your word. Would you please drive it and, 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 and plant it deeply and thoroughly into our heart. Let your word sink deep. Let, let there be grace and depth in the innermost of our lives. Father, would you please convict us? Would you please exhort us? Would you please give us courage and, 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 and clarity that we would, we would bow we would bow to your word this morning. And Father, only by the power of your spirit, we do pray. So please, Father, as you take our heads and our hearts and our hands, Lord, would you please give us the strength to read and to study and to, to obey. Oh, the joy of obe obedience, Lord. In Christ's name we pray all this. In Christ's precious name. Amen and amen. The theme of hospitality is a grand theme because it runs through the, the historical redemptive of God's working in the universe and particularly with people. Whether it is in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, the redemption story has been interwined with hospitality, if you will. From the very, very beginning in Genesis 1 and 2, the Lord puts man on earth and he puts him nowhere else but in God's garden. In the very first book of the Bible, in the very last book of the Bible, we, we have the marriage supper of the Lamb where we are invited and we are brought in to sit at the table with Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we have the Passover, one of the greatest, highest festival and celebration in the Old Testament. It is celebrated over a meal. The new covenant is inaugurated in the intimacy over a table and at a meal. The new church in Acts went from home to home. The doctrine and the theology and the scriptures were taught from home to home through the hospitality of the saints. What's interesting, when Christ gave the promises to the disciples in John 14, he did not say, in my Father's world, or in my Father's universe, or in my Father's kingdom. He said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. I will go, and I will prepare a room for you, and I will come back, and I will receive you to myself. And where I am at, there you shall be also. Everything, even all the promises, spell out this, this hospitality. If Heaven has a culture. At the heart of this culture would be hospitality. It is God welcoming. The very hands that took the nails on the cross handled a towel and served communion hours before. It was the hospitality of the Lord. So the question for us, and I want to ask, is what is it? What is it about hospitality? What is it about homes? And what is it about tables and meals? What's, what's, what's wrapped up in this thing that we call hospitality? Is it the food? Is it, is it the atmosphere? Is it the drinks? Is it the beauty of the table? Let me suggest, and by unpacking this, the table is the most intimate place in the life of a family. It's closeness, it's sharing, it's extending, it's bringing 
close and near others together. It's your own private space, and you're telling friends and strangers and people, come, come, intrude into my space. Come, you're welcomed. It's taking, it's bringing strangers into the heart of your home. It's opening up your heart to them and opening up your table to them. It's honoring them. It's caring for them. It's caring for others. It's eating the same thing, the very thing that you enjoy in life. You're partaking of that together. What you're tasting, you're tasting together. The closeness, the joy, the fellowship through food. It's tasting and it's sustenance. You're partaking of that together. It is no accident when Jesus came and said, I am the bread of life. He didn't say, I'm the sword of life. He said, I am the bread of life. So with that, I want us to really consider some of the passages. What is hospitality and how it's defined for us? I want to start out with the English dictionary. Hospitality is the friendly treatment of guests or strangers, an act or a show of welcome. This is even better. The quality or disposition of receiving and treating guests and strangers alike with warm, friendly, generous way. The New Testament word, the Greek word is philosenia, comes from the compound word is to is love and strangers. And when they're put together, it's the love of strangers. It's the love of the outsiders. The outsiders become insiders. And that's what happens in hospitality. Christian hospitality goes above and beyond that. It is one found lost sinner sharing with another sinner the blessings of God through the table. Hospitality is modeling and extending God's grace to others one meal at a time. It is both physical and spiritual refreshing of others through meals and neighboring them. Some have even called it gospel neighboring. Kevin DeYoung put it this way. He says, Opening our homes to others is a wonderful gift and a neglected discipline in the church. But we easily forget the whole point of hospitality. Think of it this way. Good hospitality is making your home a hospital. The idea is that friends and family and the wounded and the weary people come to your home and leave helped and refreshed. And hopefully stuffed too. Okay, loving our neighbor is not a random act. It is commanded. It's not a suggestion in the New Testament. It is serious as loving God with our whole being. Hospitality in our home is reflecting and displaying the expression of heaven. Everything about heaven says, come, 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 as Greg read earlier. So, God could have sent his love, but God sent himself to bring us in. And that is the welcoming of hospitality. That is divine divine hospitality. So there are six passages. The pursuit of others in hospitality. Hospitality, not neglecting, but extending God's love to strangers. And then 1 Peter 1.9, hospitality without an attitude. And then 1 Timothy 3.1 is hospitality is displaying spiritual maturity. And John 5, living out hospitality in a way that would glorify God. And finally, Matthew 25, hospitality that God takes very, very personal. And Lord Willie will make some applications with those. Turn with me to Romans 12. Chapter 13, uh, sorry, Romans 12, 13, pursuing hospitality with open hearts and open homes. Romans 12, verse 13, and it says this, contribute to the needs, to the needs of the saints eagerly pursuing hospitality. 
Hospitality is not a spiritual gift to the Martha Stewarts that are amongst us. It is what is expected in every single believer in the body of Jesus Christ. Hospitality is not just a gift. It's, it's commanded to us. It's commanded to the church. The thought here is actually pursuing opportunities for hospitality, not just, not just passively waiting and having them come to you by personally going to them, bringing them to your home. One translation has it this way. Enter into the fellowship with the needs of the saints, whether through food, whether through clothing, whether through housing, one meal at a time. One meal at a time. And what's beautiful about verse 13 is it, it, w- w- the whole chapter hangs on verse 1. And if you put verse 13 and verse 1 together, it'll say this. I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek, the Greek word is seek, pursue, run after, to show hospitality. So the motivation for hospitality is the mercies of God. Don't become a hoarder. Don't become a hoarder. Don't become a cul-de-sac. Become a conduit to the mercies of God. And Paul is saying in verse 1, show spiritual worship service by showing hospitality to one another. The mercies of God were, brought, were bought and brought by the blood of Jesus Christ. They are, not, they are new every morning with fresh generosity and hospitality. This is how we become generous. How we become generous. Romans 15, 7. Welcome one another as Christ welcomed you for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Tahibi, some of you know this dear man who came from the Grand Cayman as a pastor, and I think he's in D.C. He showed up at Mark Dever's church, and he said he was sitting down one day, and he said after they were done, this, this couple in front of him, this family in front of him, got up and asked him, hey, would you come to our house? And he politely said no. Next week said, would you like to come to our house? He said, eventually we went to their house. He said, um, by the time... By the time Jim and his family were relocating from D.C. at their last evening service, Mark Dever asked the the whole congregation, how many of you have you been to Jim's and his wife's and his family's house? 90% of the congregation stood up. He said that was about 350 to 400 people. Literally 90% stood up. Their home and their lives had become a very real extension of the church's ministry and pastoral care. They they bore the measurable fruit simply and regularly having people in their life. Pursue, pursue, and share. He said, if that wasn't enough, sounds a burden. I should also mention that Jim and his wife have six kids, adopted nephews and nieces, and lived about 45 minutes from the church. He wasn't Superman, but the, but the way and it, he and his family modeled hospitality sometimes made it seem so. It also convicts me, he says, for not forsaking ease and crossing more boundaries with the love of Christ. May Jim's tribe increase. Here is a family that reflected, reflected Romans 12, 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints through hospitality, not just by filling their stomachs, but listening to them over a meal, sharing with them God's blessing, filling the aloneness they might feel and the weaknesses they, they might have in that season. It's displaying the family atmosphere to, meet, to needy, and weak saints. I don't know about you. I have had plenty of seasons in my own life where I felt needy and, and weak. And oh, was the fellowship over a meal amazing. So not only to saints, but hospitality to strangers. To strangers. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 verses 1 and 2. 
after 12 chapters of, 12, of rich, rich theological insight and who we are and what we are in God and in Christ. Here comes the Christian ethic. Here comes the commands. And what's, what's amazing about this is he starts right off the bat in, in verses 1 and 2. He says, let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by some have entertained angels without knowing it. He was most likely referring to Abraham and Lot when they were visited by angels, by Christ himself. And the point is not that you might run into angels today. I've often, I've often thought, oh, so-and-so, they were really neat, but they were weird. But <laughs> they couldn't be angels. That's not the point here. The point is the blessings, the blessings that God bestows on that household. Abraham was blessed. Lot was protected. Rahab, the harlot, was saved through hospitality. Showing a stranger, showing hospitalities to strangers who would be her enemies. It crosses boundaries. Remember, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves are in the body. 22 pastors from urban Denver visited with the mayor of Denver and asked him this question. If we had a magic wand that we can help the city out, what would it be? The mayor took a list out. He said, Visit the shut-in, visit the elderly, be an older brother and be an older sister. And he went down the line. Reach out, reach out, reach out, reach out. And he said, as a mayor, I shouldn't be telling you this, but on a government level, relationships always trump programs. There is no government program can ever save these people. It is relationship. And we need the households of faith to do this. This is an unregenerate mayor saying this to us. Another story of showing hospitality to strangers. This is Edith Schaefer, Francis Schaefer's wife. Schaefer goes on to tell the story of a homeless man who stopped by in her house one day asking for a cup of coffee and some bread. Rather than simply giving him the bare essentials he requested, Schaefer went inside and prepared soup and two different kind of sandwiches, which she cut into triangles and arranged her best china plate. She brought his food out to the waiting man with a copy of the Gospel of John and a, and a bouquet of flowers intertwined with ivy on a tray. When her children questioned her efforts to make such beautiful and tasty presentation for a transient man who'd only requested crust and bread, Schaefer replied, quote, who knows, perhaps he'll do a lot of thinking and someday believe. Anyway, he may realize that we care something about him as a person, and that is important. Carefully chosen food, lovingly prepared and beautiful, presented table demonstrates honor toward our guests. It is, it's not an act of self-sacrifice love. Serving the needs and the desires of others is a cost, is a cost. If your prayer, Lord, Keep me close to Christ's heart. Here is God's heart, even in the Old Covenant, even in the Old Testament. If you ever say, God, keep, please, please make me, get me really as close to your heart as I can. Deuteronomy 10, 17, 
For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphans and widows and shows his love for the aliens by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for aliens, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19.33, verse 34 When a stranger resides with you in the land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. I think what he's saying is don't let your past, you've been been brought in, You've been welcomed by the mercies of God. Don't let your past leave you. Don't forget. Don't forget your past. Treat the aliens the way you've been treated. And let me just say, God doesn't trickle his grace upon us. He lavishes us with his grace. The Roman Emperor Julian, writing to his friend, this is amazing, in the 4th century, he regrets the progress of Christianity. He says, he says of Christians because it pulled people away. He says, these Christians who pulled people away from the Roman gods. He said, atheism, speaking of the Christian faith, has been specially advanced. Though the loving service Render to strangers as though their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar, and that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for help that we should render them. Our very own are looking for our own welfare." In other words, the Romans take care of the Romans. The Greeks take care of the Greeks. But these Christians take care of us all. Keller commenting on this, he says, they were very promiscuous toward helping the needy and the stranger. Be a neighbor. Don't be a geographical neighbor. Be a true neighbor. Enter. Enter into the lives. The Murphys and us took in a young man 30 almost years ago, 16 years old. I met him on a train. He turned 16 out here. He came, he was getting off drugs. Um, A month and a half after he came out here, he ended up living between both of our homes. And... um, He left. He did some crazy thing. He's hilarious. He's wonderful. He did some crazy things in our homes, but we loved him. 20 years later, he's been in and out of prison and different homes and all that. He's a dear, dear friend to us. I looked at him and we were talking and he said, we recalled some of the funny stories and he looked at me in a very, very sober way. And he said, Ray, in all my childhood and in all my life, I never had so much joy like I did living in your home and the Murphy's home. He said, those were the most joyful years of my life. Get in their lives. Get in their lives. And as you do, do it without an attitude. 1 Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 4. I will tread very lightly with all respect. I will tread very lightly here. First um, Peter chapter 4, verse 9. I love what Ken was preaching on a few weeks ago. And I, and I walked away and I realized in my own heart, um, when, when love is hot and zealous and warm, you could, it's like plastic. You could stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. And man, when it, be, when it gets cold, it snaps and it breaks. And it breaks with an attitude. It breaks with com- grumbling and complaining and, and, and being critical of others. And so he says here, be hospitable. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. And let me just make a quick remark here. If anybody, anybody knew human nature 
Peter did. Peter did. So those who might take advantage of us, who might take advantage of our hospitality, of our homes, through generosity, I, 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 it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because God lavishly graced us. I preach this to my own heart. Be frugal on yourself so you could be frivolous on God's people. Practice frugality on your own family and life so we could be frivolous upon the church who Christ is frivolous on. Without complaint. In Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. When it comes to the hospitality of the body of Christ, to be critical, complaining about the saints is to act more like Satan than like Christ. Don't want to be harsh here, but I have to say it. You have to, you have to love the way Christ loved. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Give them the best. Give them the best. Do it with faith. Do it with love. Do it with joy. Rosaria Butterfield says this in her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Yet too often, hospitality is nerve-wracking experience for hosts and guests alike. Instead of setting our guests at ease, we set them on edge by telling them how bad the food is or will be, and what a mess the house is, and how sorry we are for the kids' behavior. We get worked up and crazy busy in all the wrong ways because we are more concerned about looking good than doing good. So instead of, our, of us encouraging the, the saints, those we host, they feel compelled to encourage us constantly. No, 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 it's fine, it's good. We must think of our homes as hospitals, same word, hospice, embassies, incubators, not castles, not fortresses, or museums. One more thing about attitude If we focus on our actions without addressing our hearts, we may end up merely a better behaved lovers of self. Self Self-promotion, oftentimes hospitality is self-promotion disguised as a dinner invitation is not true hospitality. And so 1 Peter 4.10, he goes on, he says, as you receive the gifts from God, steward, 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 your home, your gifts, your money, the mercies you received. And do it by faith and splurge, splurge on the saints. Again, God didn't trickle his grace. He lavished, Ephesians 1, he lavished us with his grace. Which leads us to the fourth thing about hospitality. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. True has Hospitable people are usually reflecting spiritual maturity. There is a spiritual maturity there. There is spiritual maturity. And when it comes to hospitality, it is, it, it is amazing and it is important enough for Paul, Paul's mind to mention both in Timothy, the qualification of an elder, and Titus, that That is required of an elder. Notice what he says. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. So here is the qualification. Verse 2. By the way, these qualifications are, 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 are windows into a man's life and character. They're windows into the soul of that man. He says... An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectful. And notice, hospitable comes before able to teach. If there is anything about the sequence, if Paul meant anything, he puts hospitality before gifts and teaching. That's how important it is. In describing an elder's calling, 
Alexander Strzok noted, an open home is a sign of an open heart and a loving sacrificial spirit. A lack of hospitality is a sure sign of selfish, lifeless, loveless Christianity. And, and, and speaking of Alex Strzok, I, I love that man, taught me so much about loving people. He and I frequent this place, a Mediterranean restaurant. And one day, I wasn't there, I was told this, he bought his food and there was a family all covered up Muslims from the, Arab, from the Arabian Gulf. And at, after he purchased his food, he handed the lady a $100 bill, and he said, would you do me a favor? Tell them in Arabic that as an American Christian, I welcome them into our country because I know if I went to their home in their country, they would have me. So I would be more than glad to pay for this. Now, Alex didn't tell me the story. The person who told us the story came and sat at the table, the manager of the restaurant, who happens to be a Muslim Palestinian woman, who said, I cannot believe this man. She said, on my bookcase, I have three books, the Quran, the Bible, and Alex's book. She said, D -d 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 she said, I've never seen someone like this. I love this man. Through his hospitality, not even people coming to his home, even in a restaurant, even in a restaurant, he got the life of Christ right into that woman's living room and ministered to her. And here, a Muslim is speaking about the hospitality of a Christian and how beautiful it was. It is important. It is important. Leaders, leaders should be exemplary to the rest of the congregation. The Apostle Paul teaches us that being hospitable isn't merely a nice thing. It is essential. It is essential. Nobility and hospitality simply seem to fit together. And it's all the more appropriate that God's people, especially leaders, exhibit these qualities. That goes the same to the older woman. 1 Timothy 5, 9 and 10 speaks of this older woman who had been widowed. And it really is, again, another indication, this window into her, this woman's life and soul. It says, speaking of this older woman who's a widow, having a reputation, he says, having a reputation for good works. And if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. In other words, this woman's home was mercy ministry to strangers and to saints together. So the command of hospitality, not neglecting hospitality to strangers, hospitality without an attitude and the maturity and the, and of hospitality that, that it's reflected in our life. Fifth, showing hospitality for the glory of God. Would you turn with me to the third book of John, third letter of John, for a moment. The elder, to, verse 1, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. He says, beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and in good health, just as you, your soul prospers. For I was very glad when the brethren came and testified to your truth, that is how you are walking in the truth. This is truth personified in this man's life. And then he says, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers and they having testified to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on their way and watch this in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. 
So John is writing to this man that he seemed to have discipled. He's like a son in the faith. He says, they've been talking. They came back and they reported to us how you received them, how you hosted them, and how you sent them off in a manner worthy of God. In a manner worthy of God. And one of the, one of the greatest joy being an elder here is we get to see how you guys interact with each other. If you're not plugged into the body, you're missing out. You are missing out so much. So show hospitality. Bring people in. Host them. Let them stay with you. With you. Let them see what heaven is reflected in your living room. And do it in a manner worthy of God's glory. Don't be shut in on yourself. Don't be shut in. To underline the glory, this hospitality, whoever, listen, this is what, this is Christ's word for you guys this morning. Whoever receives you, receives me, and whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. Which means this, hospitality brings in God into your home because it's bringing in his sons and his daughters. And here's why, and he takes it very, very personal. Listen to this. You all know this Matthew 25 passage. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on, the glor- on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd se- she- separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come you who are blessed who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and I love this, and you came to me. Jesus identifies himself not with a talented the gifted, the young, and the beautiful. He identifies himself with the strangers, with the outsiders, and with the needy. You did this to me. Then the righteous, I love this, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and when did we feed you, or thirsty, and give you something to drink, and when did we see you as a stranger and invited you in and naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick in prison and come to you? What's amazing about this, about this passage is the, the righteous and the generous and the hospitable have this beautiful amnesia. They're just, they forget all the stuff because that was their life. That was their life. Generosity was their life. Hospitality was their life. And they forget when God had to remind them. The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least, even the least, you did it to me. Hospitality for strangers, God takes very, very personal. All the gifts, all the talents in the world does not make you like God as much as receiving and extending the gift of God in the love of hospitality. So finally, I want to make some application for the saints and for how to deal within the body. These are very spiritual and practical. Hospitality is a lost art in America, an overlooked, neglected command. Don't try to find loopholes like the lawyers, who is my neighbor? Don't try to do that, please. Please. Complacency is a deadly enemy of spiritual progress. Wage spiritual war on your laziness and on on complacency. Busy. Busyness. I define busyness as being under Satan's yoke. Doesn't make you special, doesn't make you wonderful. It makes you busy. And you neglect 
the beauties of God's command. Butterfield says this in her book, being available to neighbors means cutting back on your own entertainment indulgences, building in margin time in the day, and budgeting to feed many more people than those who share your last name. Make sacrifices for your unsaved neighbors. That means something. Go out of your way for them. Being hospitable in a post-Christian means meeting strangers and making them neighbors, and by God's grace, welcoming neighbors into the family of God. Our homes are crucial for this. Our homes are the bridge between the church and the world. We have to live in the world for the world, and the only way we can do that is living it from the cross. So how do we start? How do we start? Pray. Look for opportunities. When you come here, show up five minutes earlier. Sit in your car. Best spiritual decision I've made for a long time. And pray. Pray that God would use you in the body. Pray that God would bring the right person. He says, pursue hospitality. Come in here with so spiritually alert. Have the mind of Christ. Say, Lord, put the right person, the right family in my path today. Ask God to grace you. Talk. Get in people's lives in a good way. Okay? Be aware of needs around the church. It, we live in one of the most expensive counties in America. Most of us are not needy physically here, but we're needy in emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Start with distant families. Adopt a night or two. Don't, don't go crazy. Take, set aside a night or two, one for the saints and maybe one for strangers one or two nights out of the week and build from that. Be a blessing. Be a blessing to them. Make them feel as part of the family when they come in. Make it about them and about others, not about yourself. If they are Christians, ask them how they, knew, how they came to know the Lord. Ask them about their testimony. Be engaging. I love, there's one book. I've been reading this woman's blog. I can't wait till I get back to construction after reading all this. But being a neighbor without being weird, it's a great book to read. And and, I can't believe I'm suggesting this. Um, (laughs) Don't try to be a Martha Stewart, okay? Don't try to be a Martha Stewart. But be generous. Be generous with your food. Be generous in your attention to them. Make them feel at home. If they have unruly kids, engage the kids. Let the guests have the best of food. Let them eat first. Seat them at the best table of the house or the best seat at the house. The art of building and cultivating relationships are not a project. Enter lives. Enter lives through your table. Don't be a geographical neighbor. Finally, also... If they're unbelievers, be patient. Invite them. Don't worry about what they believe or who they are. Ask them about their family. Ask them what, where they're from. Ask them if they, how they grew up. Natural way to say, did you go to church with your mom and dad when you grew up? We did. Did you guys do that? And that lets end the conversation so easily. It is, it is an amazing thing what the Lord does. And and, and let me add this. When, as 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 an elder and as your pastor, I'm seeing this grievous thing happening in our country and in our nation. And I think MacArthur said this in a different way, but when your policies and your politics become your passion, You will hate the mission field. You will hate your enemies. And you will hate your neighbors. I don't have to worry about what my neighbor thinks. I know what he thinks because he's at the table passing me the potatoes and telling me exactly what he feels and thinks. Get close. Get close to them. Get close. I hope... I hope our plates and I hope our tables will wear out 
for the king and his guest. If our drywall on our houses, if our drywalls will one day speak when the king returns, they can say, oh, the epistle was alive. This family, this home was a living epistle. We witnessed it through much laughter and much tears and much friends and much family. In the power of the Holy Spirit, it's amazing that I, I, I saw this this morning. Before Christ's hands were pierced, he took up a towel, not a sword. He took up the cup of communion, not a hammer, and he passed it around. And after the piercing of the hands, he took up fish and bread and reconciled and restored the apostles back to ministry. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. One home at a time, one meal at a time. And John says in 2021, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Open your hearts, open your hands, open your homes to believers and unbelievers. Don't get shut in on yourself. And may the Lord bless, may the Lord bless every meal and multiply every meal. Let's pray. Father, we Thank you for your word that brings us to you. We thank you that your person, that Christ came into our life to bring us to his home and to, the, and to your home, Father. Thank you that we will never be banished. Thank you that you never looked at us from far away and said, no, 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 unsavable. But you came and you came by the way of to seek and to, to save the lost. And Lord, you came into our homes. You came into our living rooms so we could come to you. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Lord, I pray the depth. I pray that the depth and the height and the breadth of Christ's love would sink deep would sink deep into our hearts. Change us, Lord. Please change us. Give us open hearts. Give us open hands and give us open homes that we would love your saints. In Christ's name, amen.